Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath and welcome to the Friday night study, which we've been doing on uh, the the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And so we spend time going through lots of different material. Uh, presently, what we're doing is we're looking at the rejection of the message in 1888 and, and some of the stuff that's going to be referenced here in this book by um, Wheeland and Short, uh, uh, 1888 reexamined. Yeah. There are going to be things that we have read in A.T. Jones. There's going to be reference to uh, the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, some things that were said, and and also to things that Froome says and and other writers. So we already looked at Froome, sort of started when it came to uh, looking at at specifically the rejection of 1880, we looked at what people like Froome were saying and others about how this message was accepted, um, where we know that it's contrary, to, it's contrary to the spirit of prophecy to say that the church accepted the message of righteousness by faith or accepted the third angel's message or even the first or second as they were all rejected. Anyway, before we begin, um, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the Sabbath and um, for the opportunity we have each time we come together, people from around the world, uh, to open your word, uh, to read the spirit of prophecy and um, other materials that are pertinent, pertinent uh, to our Christian experience. We know, Lord, that we need your Holy Spirit uh, to bring a conviction that when light comes to us, we know that we are in darkness and we wish to hide from that light. But as we come to know you, we, we can recognize the necessity of seeing ourselves as sinners, that we can be converted. I pray for each person. I pray for your Holy Spirit to speak to their hearts, and I pray for your angels to watch over them, and that you can guide and direct as we seek to follow you in spite of what we see happening around us, and even what we see in ourselves. We know, Lord, that if we trust in you, you're able to deliver us. So we just ask for your presence here as we study together, and we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. So um, we came to this part uh, last Friday, and that's where we stopped, was the true reason why the message was rejected. Now, we've talked a lot about the rejection of the message, and we've read different quotes. Uh, Wheeland and Short do a fairly good job of bringing together uh the views regarding 1888 about its rejection and how the church generally takes the position that the message was never really rejected, right? So uh, this is an important point. Now, one of the things we've, we've talked about when it comes to this rejection, part of it is the message was rejected because the messengers were attacked, but also the message was uh, twisted and perverted. So that um, when you see people saying they accept the message of righteousness by faith, even amongst conservative Seventh-day Adventists who have read A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, um, because the language has been twisted, our ability to understand this message um, has been hindered. So that it's, the rewriting of history has made us think that this message is just simply what the Protestants taught, and it's just a reaffirmation of something that's that's been around for a long time. But actually, the message that Jones and Wagner present is not just the message of righteousness by faith, but it's the message of righteousness by faith in the context of the three angels' message, which is the everlasting gospel. And there's no way that that could possibly be comprehended prior to Millerite history unfolding. So, um, and this is still something that I think that Whelan and Short don't quite see. 
and and they also go a bit off in their understanding of of what the message actually is as well. So, but anyway, we're just going to start reading through this. I'll be making comments. Uh, anybody who wishes to uh, have a comment, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, uh, if you have a question, you know, I'll do my best to answer it, or someone will. Uh, but, uh, you know, I end up reading a lot, um, but it's it's really a study and, and a discussion. So I, I welcome people who want to discuss what it is we're reading. So I don't know why this isn't highlighted, the true reason why the message was rejected, because it looks like a title, but I think it should have been highlighted, but it's not in this book, in this PDF. Anyway, as we read, as we today reread the inspired messages sent for years after 1888, urging the acceptance of the message, we cannot understand, reading on the surface, why there could be any failure to do so. We have therefore made the mistake of assuming that our brethren did indeed come to accept it wholeheartedly. We must not overlook an important fact. How could anyone accept the message God sent and hate and despise the messengers whom he used? They were only men, were very positive and bold, and unfortunately for the prestige and peace of the brethren, they were right. And this made the Lord's chosen agencies of deliverance to become objects of stumbling and a stone of offense because of the prevailing unbelief. That which the Lord intended as a savor of life unto life became a savor of death unto death. And that which he sent for the finishing of his work became the beginning of a long delay. Um, to accept the message was too much humiliation. The implications were that God was somehow displeased with the spiritual condition of those who were the proper channels for special light from heaven. Okay, so before we read the Ellen White quote, one of the things we can see is this is not just characteristic of 1888. It is a characteristic of God using messengers to bring light to his people throughout sacred history. And to hate and despise the men, to show contempt to people who are bringing truth, um, instead of if if they are bringing error, you would just simply follow the counsel given in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. You would go through and humbly show them, listen to what they have to say, and then point out where the error lies. But when truth is presented, because you can't use truth to counter truth, um, the only thing you have is to attack the messengers. So this is what happened. In 1888. So Ellen White is going to present this uh, here. This is from letter 19, 1892. If the ray of light, which shone at Minneapolis, were permitted to exert their convincing power upon those who took their stand against light, if all had yielded their ways and submitted their wills to the spirit of God at that time, they would have received the richest blessings, disappointed the enemy and stood as faithful men, true to their convictions. They would have had a rich experience, but self said, no. Self was not willing to be bruised. Self struggled for the mastery, and every one of those souls will be tested again on the points where they failed then. Self and passion developed hateful characteristics. <clears throat> Um, some have been cultivating hatred against the men whom God has commissioned to bear a special message to the world. They began this satanic work at Minneapolis. Afterward, when they saw and felt the demonstration of the Holy Spirit testifying that the message was of God, they hated it the more because it was a testimony against them. The Holy Spirit will, from time to time, reveal the truth through its own agencies, and no man, not even a priest or a ruler, has a right to say, you shall not give public pub, publicity to your opinions, because I do not believe them. That wonderful I, 
in quotation marks there, may attempt to put down the Holy Spirit's teaching. They, the opposers, heard not, neither would they understand why, lest they should be converted and have to acknowledge that all their ideas were not correct. This they were too proud to do, and therefore persisted in rejecting God's counsel and the light and evidence which had been given. This is the ground which some of our leading brethren are traveling over now. Now, I don't, I don't really like to, to, to see the obvious parallel to what's been happening in this movement. Uh, but the reality is we have an opportunity and we've had many opportunities to study together. Ellen White in that history was urging the brethren, the ministers, people who had differences, to study together in a spirit of Christ, to take the time to hear what another person is saying and, and not to attack the people, not to attack the person. And, and, and this is what we have to do in all cases. We have to hear a message that's being presented and if it is not truth, we are not to attack the person, because if it's not truth, it's simple. You present truth in opposition to error, right? And that means, you know, the counsel that Ellen White gives, you know, if a brother dif differ on a point of, you know, of understanding something, you don't make him out to be a heretic, you don't twist his words and misrepresent them, but you... Do what any minister of Christ should do, any Christian should do. You sit down and you study. And if if he is in error, you need to be able to show him that he is in error. And this is something that this movement has not been good at doing when error has come in. Even when error has come in, instead of doing the work that we needed to do, we we did a hasty work. And sometimes that error wasn't really error. It was being misrepresented. And um, the person, the people would be misrepresented. They'd be characterized as, you know, some kind of fanatic or something like that. And instead of, instead of taking the time to do what we need to do, um, we, we reject, we end up ultimately rejecting what. And so this is something that we can't afford to do. So he goes on here. Um, we then in short, they go on. As in all past ages, a prophet's analysis of the truth was unflattering and unwelcome. But for us today, there is good news in facing reality. Now, who were the some? Um, note the expression, some of our leading brethren rejected God's counsel. Is it possible to know the truth of what proportion that some implies. Six years later, Ellen White identified those who rejected the message with a generic designation. The sum were the bulk of our leading, most influential brethren. The light that is given, that, that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory, was resisted, and by the action of our own brethren, has been in a great degree kept away from the world. That's letter 96, 1896. It's in the selected message. First selected message is 235. Without exception, she constantly identifies those of our own brethren who rejected as many and those who accepted as few. So he says to see chapter four of this, right? The parable of 1888 throws light on our position today. The Jews refused to receive Christ because he did not come in accordance with their expectations. This is the danger to which the church is now exposed, that the inventions of men shall mark out the precise way for the Holy Spirit to come. Though they would not care to acknowledge it, some have already done this. And because the Spirit is to come, not to praise men or to build up their erroneous theories, but to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, many turn away from it. Now, uh, a thought that comes to mind here, when it comes to this movement and this message, one of the criticisms of this movement is that it's not really, um, that it's more about an intellectual message that sort of puffs up uh, those who present it 
um, you know, we uh, think we're smarter than other people because we can do lots of math or something. Um, but the whole point of this message is a rebuke against us. The failure of July 18 prediction, for instance, should have shown us that we are not in the condition uh, to do the work that we believe that God has appointed us to do. And um, this message and the trials that we have gone, the disappointments, the experience, have all been there to reprove us of sin of righteousness and judgment. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. And instead of recognizing the work of the Holy Spirit, instead of allowing uh, our experience to change us, what we have done is we have just rejected the message. We just say, well, the message is um, is wrong, and and we believe it's wrong, not because we can show that it's wrong, but because we're embarrassed, right? So that was one of the, the reasons why many people rejected July 18th. They felt embarrassed. And, of course, if we had submitted to God, we had realized that the reason we were embarrassed and the reason why the prediction failed is because we were unready uh, to do this work. And God is trying to show us and he's trying to prepare us so that we can do the work that he's asking of us. Okay, so obviously the 1888 message was far more than a mere reemphasis of a neglected doctrine. The delegates to the conference came unexpectedly face to face with Christ when they came face to face with his message. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust. Christ Object Lessons 104. The confrontation involved the humbling of their souls into that dust, and for this they were not prepared. They resented contrition and tears trickling down their faces. So this is something that we don't want, right, as human beings. In retrospect, we can see how the love of Christ that melts hearts and professional clergy pride was unwelcome. They were steeped in success, and lowliness of heart became a stumbling block. Could this be our problem today? Now, one of the things that when we when we think about this, our minds generally look outward. The problem, well, here's the problem in the church. Here's the problem in the mood. But really, what we're being asked by God to do is to look at ourselves, you know, is this my problem? Is this why I'm in the spiritual condition that I'm in? Even though I may profess to believe the truth, am I really converted? Am I really allowing that truth to break me down so that Christ can be raised up? Okay, so in chapter four here, um, this is actually quite quite a good chapter. Um, acceptance or rejection in search of a sharper focus. So this idea of about whether the message was accept, accepted or rejected is, is one of the main principal points in uh, the 1888 message study committee and this 1888 reexamined is uh, we find that within Adventism, there's a lot of lip service regarding righteousness by faith. Uh, but when you read the books or the materials that profess to be teaching righteousness by faith, it's not right. It's it's just um, some kind of watered down gospel about how God God loves us and He accepts every one of us, and so you know we don't really need to uh, overcome sin because Christ did it all for us. That type of stuff. But there are even other counterfeits of the message. So we do some see some that are just merely legalistic. They're, they're the other way. Uh, and in a sense, they're all legalistic. But, um, but you know, what people are generally call legalistic. Anyway, we're going to read this chapter here. We're going to get through most of it, I think, today. Whether the 1888 message was accepted or rejected is more than a trivial academic controversy. It is as it is impossible to separate the gospel 
from the history of the cross, so it is impossible to appreciate the 1888 message apart from seeing the truth of its history. So this is an important point. We can say, well, I'm teaching the message of righteousness by faith, right? Now, we know that it's actually the everlasting gospel, and it's not just the third angel's message. It's all three messages. But in order to understand what this message is, it's actually the history is part of it. That is, as he's saying, you can't really appreciate whatever that message was in 1888 if you don't understand its history. So if you have a misapprehension of the history, you're going to get the message wrong. And in order to get the message right, you must have a proper appreciation of what actually was occurring. Now, I don't think Whelan and Short actually have that information. That is, they look at 1888 messages, what happened in 1888. But in order to understand what happened in 1888, you need to know what happened from 1844 to 1888. And that that's left out of their study. But of course, it would have to be the case because it's not until 1989, the time of the end, that we begin to understand the repeat of Millerite history and that we actually delve back into that history and what happens after 1844 to appreciate what actually happened in 1888. But we and in short are writing this in uh, 1987 prior to the time of the end. Um, <clears throat> we cannot correctly understand our present corporate relationship to Jesus, Christ Jesus. Um, we understand that we cannot correctly understand our present corporate relation to Christ unless we understand that reality. Now, um, so when he's talking about a corporate relationship, sometimes he talks about um, the church's relationship in a sense of corporate. Um, though I would think that really this would be corporate here should be about our relationship as an individual, the body of Christ, the part that we have in Christ. But anyway, that's sort of an aside. So he says, confusion is dangerous, for it is well known that a people who do not know history are fated to repeat it and may already be doing so. Ellen White's account of the history is clear and impossible to misunderstand. Nevertheless, one author represents the historical evidence as being ambiguous. Now, uh, this Peace guy, uh, a Peace, however you say, I can't remember his first name. Uh, anybody remember his first name? NF Peace, The Faith That Saves. So these, these were books that were around in, uh, when I first became an Adventist. I know I seen some of his books, uh, which, I didn't particularly like. So, um, so I know he was on the liberal side of what we call the new theology. But anyway, the question has often been discussed. What happened following the Minneapolis General Conference of 1888? Did the church accept or reject the new emphasis on the gospel of salvation? If a person studies the records of those years looking for evidence of acceptance, he can find such evidence. On the other hand, one who looks for evidence of rejection can also find what he seeks. So here, it's, as he's saying, it's ambiguous. We're not really sure. You know, it, it just kind of depends on what you're looking for. However, the important issue is not whether the church accepted the message. Ellen White says that Satan succeeded in shutting it away from our people in a great measure. Um, and this, to me, is really the issue is that the message of righteousness by faith, because it wasn't in the context of the prophetic message, lost its power. And, um, and, and so the message isn't really understood, even by conservative Adventists. The church never had a fair chance to consider it undistorted and unopposed, right? So if the message had not been unopposed, if it had not been distorted, then I believe that that message could have been appreciated because I think it would have, its its connection to the past would have been complete. That is, you know, it's kind of ifs are big things, but uh, I think that if it had, but the thing is, the if is, since they had already rejected the first and second angels' message, it is unlikely that they would have accepted the third. So the reason why it was opposed 
was because the message light had already been rejected prior to 1888. The issue is whether the leadership accepted it. That's, that's what um, we even in short say. Ellen White speaks frankly about this. Her testimony is present truth, relevant to our spiritual state today. The worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church has been taught through authoritative publications that the 1888 message was accepted in that generation by the predominant leadership and has been the secure doctrinal possession of the church ever since. Here is a rich and increased with goods assumption. Norval, that's the guy's name, Normal, Norval FPs, um, which comes from uh, the North Valley. That's the idea. It's interesting. North Valley. Okay. okay. Here is a rich and increased with goods assumption. Briefly stated, the official view follows. Um, the rank and file of Seventh-day Adventist workers and lady accepted the 1888 presentations at Minneapolis and were blessed. Certain leading men there resisted the teaching. And this is from a further appraisal of the manuscript, 1888 reexamined, General Conference, September 1958. So that's from the first publication of this manuscript, 1888 reexamined. This, this is actually uh, the updated version from 1987. An authoritative volume, which at its initial publication bore the endorsement of two general conference presidents, was read critically by some 60 of our ablest scholars. Doubtless, no volume in our history has ever had such a magnificent pre-publication support. This book informs us that the opposition to the message was insignificant because eventually less than 10 delegates to the 1888 session actually rejected the message or were unfavorable to it. This astounding view deserves close attention, for if it is true, we must believe it. Um, the charge that the leading of uh, the teaching of righteousness by faith was rejected in 1888 by the denomination, or at least by its leadership, is refuted by the personal participants at the conference and is an unwarranted and unsupported assumption. It simply is not true historically. This is what Froome is saying in the movement of destiny. We looked at some of his stuff. Some leading brethren stood in the way of light and blessing, but the leaders as a group never rejected the Bible doctrine of righteousness by faith. So this is what Froome says. Okay. Of the approximately 90 delegates registered at the Minneapolis General Conference of 1888, there were less than a score. And consequently, not even a fourth of the total number of participants who actually fought the message. And most of those who first took issue made confessions and thenceforth seized their opposition. Only a small hardcore of diehards continued to reject it. The sum who rejected turns out to be less than 20 out of more than 90, less than one quarter. And according to Olson, most of those 20 made confessions, hence ceased being rejectors and thus becoming acceptors. So this, um, so this is from Firm again, um, Movement of Destiny. The book further informs us that the message was initially accepted in 1888 by the leadership of the church. The denomination as a whole and its leadership in particular did not reject the message and provisions of righteousness by faith in and following 1888. The new president wholeheartedly accepted and maintained the teaching of righteousness by faith. The responsible leaders of the movement from 1888 to 1897 definitely did not reject it. So again, uh, from uh, both the general conference vice president um, and president in separate statements agree. So we're going to have one from A.V. Olson. And, and uh, during my 55 years in the Seventh-day Adventist ministry, I've never heard a worker or a lay member express opposition to the message of righteousness by faith. Neither have I known of any such opposition having been expressed by Seventh-day Adventist publications. Uh, that's a book, Through Crisis to Victory. Um, it is correct to say that the 1888 message has been declared both from the pulpit and through the press and by the lives of thousands upon thousands of God's dedicated people, Adventist pastors and evangelists, have announced this vital truth from church pulpits and public platforms 
with hearts aflame for the love of Christ. It has been suggested by a few entirely erroneously that the Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh Adventist Church has gone astray in failing to grasp this great fundamental Christian teaching. And that, and that last one is by um, Fergier, the General Conference President, uh, in a foreword in the book By Faith Alone by Peace, Norval Peace. Okay, so um, now part of what they're saying is when they're talking about this fundamental Christian teaching and they're talking about righteousness by faith, they're obviously not talking about the message that A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner presented in 1888 because that message was not just a reiteration of something already understood. It was indeed a new message. The longtime secretary of the Ellen G. White estate assures us that the message was generally accepted. Um, this is Arthur L. White. Um, the concept of the general conference and thus the denomination rejected the message of righteousness by faith in 88 is without foundation. Contemporary records yield no suggestion of denominational rejection. There's no E.G. White statement anywhere that says this was so. The historical record of the reception in the field following the session supports the concept that favorable attitudes were quite general. It would seem that disproportionate emphasis has come to be given to the experience of the Minneapolis General Conference session. Following the lead of other scholars, another author remarks, um, does this mean that the church as a whole or even its leadership rejected the 1888 message? Not at all. Some rejected it, a vocal minority. A new leadership wholeheartedly endorsed the new emphasis. Now, you can see, of course, a lot of their language is like this new emphasis. Was it just a new emphasis? Is that all 1888 was about, was a new emphasis? I think it was something new, something that that was now seen in a way that was never seen before. That's my understanding of Jones and Wagner's message. If these official views are substantiated by history and by testimony from Ellen White, we are under more obligation to believe them. But we have a problem because she repeatedly likens the leadership rejection to the 1888 message, to that of the Jews against Christ. That was not acceptance. If these statements are true, it is hard to understand why Ellen White should be so concerned for a decade and even longer about what she said was continued rejection of the message on the part of our brethren at headquarters when so few opposed it. Would the Lord withhold from the entire world, world church the blessings of the latter reign and the loud cry if less than 10 ministers persisted in opposing it, and they not even leaders? If so, can we ever hope for a better percentage of acceptance of any message heaven might send us? And if the Lord withholds from all of us the blessings of his Holy Spirit because of such a minuscule opposition, what hope do we have that there ever can be a finishing of the gospel commission? Of course, a rhetorical uh, question. The Jews denial takes two forms. So we're dealing about the Jews when they rejected the Messiah. A case of my mistaken identity. Jesus of Nazareth was not the Messiah, they say, and therefore rejecting him was no serious mistake. A case of mistaken blame. The Romans, not they, crucified him. Okay, it is evident in many of the above statements that we also have a problem. There is, is mistaken identity. Almost all of these authors evade the fact that the 1888 message was the beginning of the latter reign and the loud cry. Practically without exception, they identify the 1888 message as a mere re-emphasis of the 16th century Protestant doctrine of justification by faith as the popular church churches teach it. There is a problem of misplaced blame. It is uniformly insisted that only a few unimportant individuals resisted and rejected the message, most of the others repenting. So that in the end, the message was quite well accepted by the responsible leadership of the church. Dr. Froome tells us that A.W. Spalding and L.H. Christian's accounts of the 1888 history are in complete harmony with the facts. And A.V. Olson's likewise suggests that Spalding presents the whole truth of the matter. 
Their accounts differ markedly from Alan White's, but since they enjoy such full modern endorsement, they deserve our close attention. Um, the greatest event of the 80s in the experience of the Seventh-day Adventists was the recovery or the restatement, a new consciousness of their faith in the basic basic doctrine of Christianity. Right. So as you can see here, it's just this basic doctrine. We're just reemphasizing it. Right. Recovering it, restating it to new consciousness. The last decade of the century saw the church developing through this gospel into a company prepared to fulfill the mission of God. The church was aroused by the revival message of justification by faith. Now, it's kind of interesting here because when we think about this, um, uh, uh, they use the word developing. Now, developing, the church is developing and it's growing and we know all those types of things. But a lot of this idea about the development of the church is that the church was actually had all kinds of wrong ideas. And and it's almost like an evolution. The church e develops into something better. Right. But we know that the church is actually not developing. What is it doing in this history? I mean, it might be growing in numbers and in organizational structure. But as far as the truth of the gospel is the church really growing in this history. Just an awkward we, we would have, thing. We'd have to say, no, it's not. Because it's like saying that, you know, the 40 years in the wilderness was just the development of the Israelites. They were in the I wilderness. Remember. Yeah. Uh, I, I, re I remember after about uh, tw over 20 years thinking to myself that I'd gone to so many revelation seminars that I could pretty much teach them. Mm -hmm. um, and that there was just nothing new. And so in that sense, I really got a, a really strong, strong idea that I hadn't grown in 20 years and neither had the church. Yeah. No, and this is this is a problem, and it, and it creates a great deal of discouragement. Um, um, you, you know, for me, I mean, I went through an experience where, you know, I'm well-read guy, so so I knew that I knew lots, but coming into this message showed me how little I actually understood of God's word, and how little I understood of Adventism. So even though I I study had studied lots of things, I I knew lots of things. Um, the only thing that God was really uh, giving me that that I knew I knew that nobody was accepting this message of righteousness by faith, or very few, very few understood it amongst conservative uh, ministers and and a lot of these different organizations that they didn't really quite understand it. And it thrills it that, thrills my it thrills my soul when I hear it. Yeah. Well, for me, it was it was a discouragement. And in some ways, I would say my discouragement because I, I preached Jones and Wagner's messages for years and it didn't seem to stir very many people. People all seemed to think that they knew it and that 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 was enough. But it's not about knowing it. It's about experiencing it. And so. You know, in some ways, there might have been an intellectual acceptance of some of the ideas of Jones and Wagner, you know, over time. But the message was not accomplishing the work that it was supposed to accomplish. And that's because there was a resistance to light. That's the real reason of the rejection. That's what Ellen White's really talking about. Not so much intellectually when people are agreeing to something, but whether it's actually changing them. I would I would share an experience of mine in the rejection of it in my life, mm -hmm. and and that was that it was working, and uh, sins were falling away like feathers off of a chicken, and and for some reason I was uncomfortable with that. I uh, it was like it was too good, and. I 
I found myself what would what happen is I would get busy in something and then I wouldn't particularly do studies that day or you know skip skip this or that that helps to make us live it but it was easy to do because of it was so good it was it was the light of this message of righteousness by faith is so overwhelming that uh, it, it either takes all of us or none of us and there's something about that all of us commitment that uh, I drew back from. There's this tendency in the human heart, I believe, to draw back from that, converting, fully converting the full light of God's love, uh, understanding. I mean, there's a number of things. One is it's it's a cross. What God is asking of us is something unimaginable to human nature. But it also puts us at odds, at odds with those around us. And that's sometimes, you know, I've seen people receive the message and as they start to change and then they feel the opposition of people around them, right? People, people's disapproval for their fanatical ideas. And sometimes they just are pushed out of the church, uh, but sometimes they stay in the church, which, you know, they just go to sleep, right? Um, I remember the pastor who baptized me told me that this was going to happen to me. He says, you know, yeah, I know right now you, you know, you're all excited and you're studying all these things. This is when I was a new Adventist, been an Adventist probably about a year or so. But he says, eventually you'll be like everyone else. You'll just you'll just go to church and sit in the pew and and uh, so we 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 use you while we can. A, a very cynical statement by a pastor. Okay, this next statement is from uh, this L.H. Christian. I don't know who that is, but 1888 is a notable landmark in Seventh Day Adventist history. It was really like crossing a continental divide into a new country. Some smiters of the brethren calling themselves reformers have tried to make out that the session was a defeat, whereas the truth is that it stands out as a glorious victory. It introduced the new period in our work, a time of revival and soul saving. The Lord gave his people a marvelous victory. It was the beginning of a great spiritual awakening among, awakening among Adventists, the dawn of a glorious day for the Adventist church. The after effect of the great Minneapolis revival beginning in 1888 was rich in both holiness and mission fruitage. Okay. So I tried to read that with a little bit of sarcasm. There, but note that one of our authors unwittingly fulfills Christ's prophecy concerning the leadership of the Laodicean church. He uses the very word that Christ puts into the lips of the angel of the church who claims to be rich and enriched through an assumed acceptance of the message. Was the message accepted or rejected? Surely our author would not want to label a former illustrious general conference president as a smiter of the brethren, but logically, A.G. Daniels must fit into that category, where he clearly says that the 1880 history marked a defeat in the onward progress of the cause of God. Now, uh, A.G. Daniels is interesting because he did write a book, Christ and Our Righteousness, or something like that, or The Righteousness of Christ, similar title to E.J. Wagner's uh, book that is his 1888 uh, presentations. Um, so he does um, acknowledge that the message wasn't fully received. And, and there's definitely something that happens to Daniels as far as his understanding of the message. Um, so some, in some ways, I'm not, I'm not totally res resolved in how to understand Daniels. It seems to me that he accepts the message as an idea, um, and promotes some aspects of it. But whether he's actually affected by it or not, I can't really, I can't really say. But here's what he says. Um, yeah, the book is called Christ Our Righteous, Righteousness. Uh, this message of righteousness in Christ met with opposition on the part of earnest, well-meaning men in the cause of God. 
The 1888 message has never been received, nor proclaimed, nor given free course, as it should have been in order to convey to the church the measureless blessings that were wrapped within it. The division and conflict which arose among the leaders because of the opposition to the message of righteousness in Christ produced a very unfavorable reaction. The rank and file of the people were confused and did not know what to do. Back of the opposition is revealed the shrewd plotting of that mastermind of evil. How terrible must be the results of any victory of his in defeating it. Throughout this book, Daniels insists that there was no denomination-wide revival and acceptance of this message and experience. In 1926, he considered uh, the revival to be yet future. Through the intervening years since 1888, there has been stead steadily developing the desire and hope, yes, the belief, that someday the message of righteousness by faith would shine forth in all its inherent glory, worth, and power and receive full recognition. The mighty revival that others say took place, Daniel's placed in the category of what might have been. What a mighty revival of true godliness, what a manifestation of divine power for the finishing of the work might have come to the people of God. If all our ministers had gone forth from that conference as did this loyal, obedient servant of the Lord, Ellen White. So Daniel's um, definitely is not taking the position that these other people are. Ellen White must also logically come under Christian stricture of being a smiter of the brethren, for she summed up at the end of the 1888 era, um, she summed up the end of the 1888 era as a time of victory for our enemy when she said that Satan succeeded in a great measure in keeping the message away from both the church and the world. A.T. Jones, when he was walking humbly with the Lord, must also come under the same stricture. And not only he, but the congregation assembled at the general conference session of 1893. Yet they were close to the real situation. Not one person dared to challenge the speaker, for all knew he was telling the truth. When did that message of righteousness of Christ begin with us as a people? One or two in the audience, three or four years ago. Which was it? Three or four? Congregation four. Yes, four. Where was it? Congregation Minneapolis. What then did the leading brethren reject at Minneapolis? Some in the congregation. The loud cry. What did the brethren in that fearful position in which they stood reject at Minneapolis? They rejected the latter rain, the loud cry of the third angel's message. So that's from the General Conference Bulletin, 1893, page 183. In 1908, Jones tells of official opposition continuing during those 21 years against God's message of righteousness by faith. Today, in positions of presidents of union conferences and of officials of the general conference, there are men who at the beginning oppose then and all the way since by every question that they could devise the truth of righteousness by faith as that truth is in the plain word of the scriptures. This I know because more than once have I been held up by the hour in that very way by these very men. If the rank and file of Seventh-day Adventist workers and laity accepted the presentations at Minneapolis, would it not be reasonable to expect that years later Jones could remember at least one of them besides Ellen White? Thirteen years after 1908, he recalls, I can now name, not name, I can't now name anyone who accepted the truth at that 1888 meeting openly, besides Ellen White, obviously. But later, many said that they were greatly helped by it. One Battle Creek man said at that meeting after one of Dr. Wagner's meetings, now we could say amen to all of that if it, if that is all there were to it. But away down yonder, there's still something to come, and this is to lead us to that. And if we say amen to this, we'll have to say amen to that. And then we are caught. There was no such thing. And so they robbed themselves of what their own hearts told them was the truth. And by fighting what they only imagined, they fastened themselves in opposition to what they knew that they should have said amen to. Now, um, I, I think actually he is the, the person there that's uh, 
that Wagner's talk or that uh, Jones is talking about that heard Wagner's uh, meeting, I think there is actually something to it. Um, because this message was to draw us to a cross. And I think the thing that was that, that, that they didn't want to face was the cross. That's why people reject truth. And so he knew if he said amen to what was being presented, that there was something down the line that he wasn't willing to say amen to. And I think that's true of all of us. <clears throat> um, in the same letter, Jones added that the opposers were all who could be swung by general conference influence. Jones once said that some accepted the message at the Minneapolis conference, some rejected, and some stood in between. So that's from the General Conference Bulletin 1893, page 185, that he's partially quoting here. Those who favor the acceptance theory have interpreted this to mean that the group was divided roughly into thirds, and since it is assumed that many who initially rejected or were neutral later repented, the great majority are assumed to have ended up accepting the message. Jones' 1921 statement continues with a different view. Others would favor it, but when the spirit of persecution was strong, instead of standing nobly in the fear of God, declaring in the face of the attack, it is the truth of God and I believe it in my soul, they would begin to yield and in an apologetic way offer excuses for those who were preaching it. Such a wishy-washy attitude is anything but true acceptance of the message of Christ's righteousness. Those who follow Christ are prepared to die for his truth. Jones has left on record his opinion of the extent of the worldwide denominational revivals which followed the 1888 conference. The following from his 1921 letter is quoted in an officially approved book which supports the acceptance view. When camp meeting time came after 1888, we all three, Ellen White, Wagner, and himself, uh, visited the camp meetings with the message of righteousness by faith, sometimes all three of us at the same meeting. This turned the tide with the people and apparently with most of the leading men. So this is quoted by Pease. Uh, the quotation in the book stops here, but Jones' next sentence refutes the acceptance thesis. But this latter was only apparent it was never real. For all the time in the General Conference Committee and amongst others, there was a secret antagonism always carried on and which finally gained the day in the denomination and gave to the Minneapolis spirit and contention and men the supremacy. The letter was written when Jones was not far from his death. It reveals a chastened spirit of loyalty to all Seventh-day Adventist doctrinal beliefs and to the full inspiration of Ellen White's prophetic ministry. Within five years, A.G. Daniel published his view that essentially agrees with that of Jones. The message has never been received, nor proclaimed, nor given free course as it should have been in order to convey to the church the measureless blessings that were wrapped within it. But we do not need to depend on Jones or Daniel's appraisal of what happened. We have other testimony. Um, so significant inspired evidence. Candidly investigated, Ellen White's um, writings are never ambiguous on this issue of the reception of the 1888 message. She cannot support both sides of two contradictory views. Jones' remark about the tide being turned only apparently with the leading brethren is substantiated by Ellen White. For nearly two years, 1890, we have been urging the people to come up and accept the light and truth concerning the righteousness of Christ, and they do not know whether to come and take hold of this precious truth or not. Um, so this is review on Herald, March 11th, 1890. Um, so uh, the book goes on here. It says, why was this? Next week, she told the reason why the lay members and younger ministers were hesitant. Our young men look to our older brethren, and as they see that they do not accept the message, but treat it as though it were of no consequence, it influences those who are ignorant of the scriptures to reject the light. These men who refuse to receive truth interpose themselves between the people and the light. 
She also agreed with Jones' statement that there was not one of the leading brethren at the headquarters willing to take a firm stand for the message of Christ's righteousness. Again and again, I bear my testimony to those assembled, Minneapolis, 1888, in a clear and forcible manner, but that testimony was not received. When I came to Battle Creek, I repeated the same testimony in the presence of Elder Butler, but there was not one who had the courage to stand on my side and help Elder Butler to see that he, as well as others, had taken wrong positions. The prejudice of Elder Butler was greater after hearing the various reports from our ministering brethren at that meeting in Minneapolis. So that's from January 25th, 1889, letter U3, um, 1889. Uh, the brethren who said she, who she said interposed themselves were leaders. Thank God not all refused to receive the truth, but the term, our own brethren, is generic in sense. It must mean the bulk of the responsible leadership with a few, if any, influential exceptions. She uses the term repeatedly, and what is significant, she uses it in retrospect. At Minneapolis, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure, the special power of the Holy Spirit. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truth to the world. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with, with its glory was resisted. And by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. No way could a few uninfluential diehard opposers have such a determinative effect if many of the leading brethren wholeheartedly received the message. To believe that the tail could wag the dog thus would stretch credulity. She wrote the following to a relative after most of the influential confessions had come in. The, who of those that acted apart in the meeting of Minneapolis have come to the light and received the rich treasures of truth, which the Lord sent them from heaven? Who have kept step with the leader, Jesus Christ? Who have made full confession of their mistaken zeal, their blindness, their jealousies and evil surmisings, their defiance of truth? Not one. So that's letter November 5th, 1892. Seven or eight long years after 1888, she is forced to confess concerning some in Battle Creek who keep alive the spirit which ran riot in Minneapolis and who are also identified as many. They began this satanic work at Minneapolis. Yet these men have been holding positions of trust and have been molding the work after their own similitude as far as they possibly can. Now, um, so one of the things when we, we think about this satanic work, when they rejected the light of that was presented at Minneapolis, the leadership began to go into darkness. Uh, they were in darkness in regard to Ellen White. They were darkness in regard to many of the truths taught by uh, the Millerites and the pioneers. Uh, the daily is one of them. Right. All of these things were happening because they had rejected this message of Jones and Wagner. Just because they say they accepted it doesn't mean they did. A.G. Daniels encourages us to be honest in facing reality. It would be far more agreeable to eliminate some of the statements given by the spirit of prophecy regarding the attitude of some of the leaders toward the message and the messengers. But this cannot be done without giving only a partial presentation of the situation leaving the question in more or less, more or less of mystery. The less mystery is the better in this late perilous hour. Therefore, the following citations, as brief as possible, but verbatim, are taken from testimonies to ministers written in 1895. This is Ellen White's retrospective judgment, written pretty well toward the close of the 1888 era. Many treat the message with disdain. You have turned your back and not your face to the Lord. That light which is to fill the whole earth with its glory has been despised. Beware how you pour contempt upon the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I know not, but some have even now gone too far to return and to repent. These great and solemn realities are unappreciated and spoken against. Men stand in the way of sinners. 
and sit in the seat of scornful. Many have entered dark, secret paths. Some will never return. They have tempted God. They have rejected light. They have chosen darkness rather than the light and have defiled their souls. They have not only refused to accept the message, but they have hated the light. These men are parties to the ruin of souls. They have interposed themselves between the heaven-sent light and the people. They have trampled upon the word of God and are doing despite to his Holy Spirit. Have stood for years resisting light and cherishing the spirit of opposition. How long will you hate and despise the messengers of God's righteousness? They have taunted them, the messengers, with being fanatics, extremists, and enthusiasts. You will, when it is too late, uh, see that you have been fighting against God. Your turning things upside down is known of the Lord. Go on a little longer as you have done in rejection of the light from heaven, and you are lost. So long as false guideposts pointing the wrong way. If you reject Christ's delegated messengers, you reject Christ. Despise this glorious offer of justification through the blood of Christ. I entreat you, cease your stubborn resistance of light and evidence. So that's testimonies to ministers, these different statements taken from page 89 to 98. Uh, this is what our authors speak of as the notable landmark in Seventh-day Adventist history. The crossing of a continental divide into new country, the glorious victory and the occasion and the beginnings of larger and better things for the Advent Church. The time of revival and soul saving, the time of happy experience, the beginning of a great awakening among Adventists, a denomination wide revival. Ellen White wrote better than she knew in 1895. You're turning things upside down is known of the Lord. Seven or eight years after the conference afforded ample opportunity for repentance, confessions, and a hearty participation in a denomination-wide revival. The chronology of rejection can be cataloged year by year. Instead of pressing your weight against the chariot of truth that is being pulled up an inclined road, you should work with all your, the energy you can to push it on. Our bre older brethren do not accept the message, but treat it as though it were of no consequence. So that's from March 18th, 1890. I cannot express to you my burden and distress of mind as the true condition of the cause has been presented before me. It was shown to me that on the part of the ministers in all of our conferences, there is a neglect to study the scriptures, to search for the truth, faith, and love. How destitute are the churches of these? Bible religion is very scarce, even among our ministers. The standard of the ministry has been greatly lowered. Coldness, heartlessness, want of temper, tender sympathy are leaving the camp of Israel. If these evils are permitted to strengthen as they have done for some years in the past, our churches will be in a deplorable condition. There was not much revival by 1892. The atmosphere of the church is so frigid, its spirit is of such an order that men and women cannot sustain or endure the example of primitive and heaven-born piety. The warmth of their first love is frozen up. And unless they are watered over the baptism of the Holy Spirit, their candlestick will be removed out of its place. It was the same in 1893. Oh, how few know the day of their visitation. We are convinced that among the people of God, there is blindness of mind and hardness of heart. Although God has manifested an expressible mercy toward us, today there are few who hardly are heartily serving God. The most of those who compose our congregations are spiritually dead in trespass and sins. The sweetest melodies that come from God through human lips justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ, do not bring forth from them a response of love and gratitude. They steal their hearts against the heavenly merchantmen. Conditions had not improved by 1895. Um, there are many who have outgrown their Advent faith while saying in their hearts, as they desire it shall be, 
my Lord delayeth his coming. Men who are entrusted with weighty responsibilities, but who have no living connection with God, have been and are doing despite to his Holy Spirit. Warnings have come from God again and again for these men, but they have cast them aside and ventured on in the same course. If God spares their lives and they nourish the same spirit that marked their course of action, both before and after the Minneapolis meeting, they will fill up to the full the deeds of those whom Christ condemned when he was upon earth. And there had been apparently little change by 1896, right? So we just can see all of this that had been happening in that history, it is still continued. And it's true of us today, right? So we sometimes, you know, we look back at this and we say, oh, those terrible men. But the question is, has this message affected us and changed our lives? But do I profess to accept the message? Because many profess to accept it. And the understanding of the message is not an intellectual understanding. It is an experience. Unless one experiences uh, salvation, and it's just merely a theory, it's really meaningless to that individual. They can profess to believe it. But if it doesn't change us, it doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> um, so from 1888 to 1890, Ellen White makes numerous references to the revival meetings, which she held in company with Jones and Wagner. Um, the acceptance theory is based largely on these statements. We must give due weight to them. The following are samples of her glowing enthusiasm. Asm. I've never seen a revival work go forward with such thoroughness and yet remains so free from all undue excitement. There was no urging or inviting. The people were not called forward. There was a solemn realization that Christ came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. There were many who testified that at the searching truths, as the searching truths had been presented, they had been convicted in the light of the law as transgressors. The tidings that Christ is our righteousness has brought relief to many, many souls. And God says to his people, go forward. In every meeting since the general conference, souls have eagerly accepted the precious message of the righteousness of Christ. On Sabbath, and this is in Ottawa, Kansas, uh, truths were presented that were new to the majority of the congregation, but the labors of the Sabbath were not in vain. On Sunday morning, there was decided evidence that the Spirit of God was working great changes in the moral and spiritual condition of those assembled. Now, one of the things we see here is that these meetings are not just attended by Seventh-day Adventists, but by people from other denominations, because these are, are public meetings. Uh, we are having most excellent meetings. The spirit that was in the meeting at Minneapolis is not here. All moves off in harmony. The universal testimony from those who have spoken has been that this message of light and truth which has come to our people is just the truth for this time. And wherever they go among the churches, light and relief and the blessing of God is sure to come in. Uh, these statements taken out of a 10 year context give the impression of a hearty leader acceptance of the message. But further evidence in context must be considered. An impression of leadership acceptance must be balanced by reality. Joan said that those meetings turned the tide with the people. However, there was never an issue or a tide to be turned with the people. The problem was entirely with the leaders and the ministry. The people were ready to accept the light gladly if the leaders should permit it to come to them undistorted and unopposed, or rather, if they should join heartily in presenting it. Many younger ministers were keenly interested, but the continually non-committal attitude or outright opposition of responsible leaders in Battle Creek and elsewhere, quenched the movement. Not only did Ellen White's remark attest this fact, but the general conference correspondence in the archives is also clear. In fact, it is not, ne not necessary even to summer, summon her to the witness stand to testify to this official Battle Creek rejection of the message. The documentation in the recorded correspondence demonstrates an undercurrent of opposition 
which Joan spoke of as secret antagonism, always carried on. At Minneapolis, Ellen White quickly saw that the problem lay with the leadership. She earnestly appealed to the delegates not to look to the older experienced men to see what they would do with the light. She said that they would even try to prevent it reaching the people. I entreat you to make God your trust. Otherwise, no man. Depend on no, upon no man. Let not your love of men hold them in places of trust that they are unqualified to, fulfill, to fill. You need greater light. You need a clearer understanding of the truth, which you carry to the people. And if you do not see light yourselves, you will close the door. If you can, you will prevent the rays of light from coming to the, to the people. Let it not be said of this highly favored people. They would not enter in themselves and those who were entering in, they hindered. All these lessons are given for the benefit of those upon whom the ends of the world are come. At this meeting, opposition rather than investigation is the order of the day. No one must be permitted to close the avenue um, whereby the light of truth shall come to the people. As soon as this shall be attempted, God's spirit will be quenched. Um, it's a manuscript, 15, 18, 88. Funny what this document's doing. Okay, that's better. Now our meeting is drawing to a close and not one confession has been made. There's not been a single break so as to let the spirit of God in. Now I was saying, what was the, co the use of our assembling here together and for our ministering brethren to come in if they are here only to shut out the spirit of God from the people? So manuscript 9, 1888. What was the actual mechanism of rejection? How did it operate? While it is true that Jones and Wagner were permitted to speak in camp meetings and publish articles, and while it is true that their message was welcomed by the laity, leadership rejection constantly counteracted their best efforts. We have Ellen White's analysis of what happened. The very men who ought to be on the alert to see what the people of God need, that the way of the Lord may be prepared, are intercepting the light God would have come to his people and rejecting the message of his healing grace. Some of our leading brethren have frequently taken positions on the wrong side. And if God would send a message and wait for these older brethren to open the way for its advance, it would never reach the people. The rebuke of the Lord will be upon those who would be guardians of the doctrine and who would bar the way that greater light should come to the people. And if there were no voice among men to give it, the very stones would cry out. It is the coldness of heart, the unbelief of those who ought to have faith that keeps the churches in feebleness. Uh, Review and Herald, July 26, 1892. At the time, both Jones and Wagner were persona non grata with responsible brethren in Battle Creek. As we shall see in the later, a later chapter, the Review and Herald editor was the most influential opposer. So who's the Review and Herald editor? Uriah, Uriah Smith. Smith, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, Uriah Smith. And Ellen White said that the new General Conference president himself acted as did Aaron in regard to these men who have been opposed to the work of God ever since the Minneapolis meeting. The president of the General Conference went directly contrary to the cautions and warnings given him concerning the 1888 aftermath. Further, it was only natural that opposing brethren should expect and very likely hope that the unwelcome message should take no better with the common people than it did with the elders and authorities of Battle Creek. But when the reports came in of the wonderful results of the preaching of the inspired trio, they were chagrined. It is painful to report that Ellen White says that the Holy Spirit's approval of the work discomfited them she was not concerned about an insignificant minority of obscure, obscure brethren, but about the total impact of a responsible, influential, influential leadership. Afterward, when they saw and felt the demonstration of the Holy Spirit testifying that the message was of God, they hated it the more, because it was a testimony against them. They would not humble their hearts to repent, to give God the glory and vindicate the right. The revivals held at South Lancaster, Chicago, Ottawa, Kansas, and in Battle Creek, 
church itself were a powerful witness that God has set had set his seal to the message being born. The experiment testing the light um, was made uh, was being made in the laboratory of the churches. It worked, never had such manifestations of heavenly glory, attended any message or movement since the midnight cry of 1844. Now, although there had been determined effort to make no effect the message God has sent, its fruits had been proving that it was from the source of light and truth. Uh, those who have stood to the bar to bar the way against all evidence cannot be supposed to have a clearer spiritual eyesight for having so long closed their eyes to the light God sent to the people. There will be resistance from the very ones we expected to engage in such a work. She continued to hope for a change of heart in the leaders, heart in the leaders. Once they recognized the incontrovertible proof, the following paragraph could be cited as evidence that the 1888 message was accepted by the leadership of the church. Um, I saw that the power of God attended the message wherever it was spoken. You could not make the people believe in South Lancaster that it was not a message of light that came to them. God has set his hand to do this work. We labored in Chicago. It was a week before there was a break in the meetings. But like a wave of glory, the blessing of God swept over us as we pointed men to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Lord revealed his glory, and we felt deep movings of his spirit. But the same article in the review of March 18, 1890, indicates that the leading brethren still were not in sympathy with the work. I've tried to present the message to you as I have understood it. But how long will those at the head of the work keep themselves aloof from the message of God? A greater sin was added to the unbelief of 1888 at Minneapolis. The incontrovertible evidences of the Holy Spirit's approval of the message demonstrated in the wonderful revivals only confirmed the opposition of these brethren. When they saw and felt the demonstration of the Holy Spirit testifying that the message was of God, they hated it the more. A few years before, Ellen White had pathetically appealed for unity with the messengers. For nearly two years, we have been urging the people to come up and accept the light and truth concerning the righteousness of Christ. And they do not know whether to come and take hold of this precious truth or not. We entreat of you to oppose the light of truth to stand out of the way of God's people. The overwhelming weight of evidence indicates that they did not stand in the way or that they did stand in the way, pardon me. This context of the glowing report of the revivals must be borne in mind. Earlier statements expressing prophetic hope must be balanced by the disappointment of the actual subsequent history which Ellen White was forced to record. Um, every avenue um, of solid evidence goes in the same direction. Her testimony, Joan's testimony, the official archival files, and the obvious import of nearly a century of history. Um, let's see how much more here. So I'm going to deal with this next week, just like the Jews. Okay. I, I know that I always end up doing a lot of talking and, and reading. Now, I know that many people who have been following these studies are not as familiar with 1888 as as they should be. Obviously, people who went through the 80s and 90s were aware of all the controversies that were going on. And and one of the things that I've pointed out is um, it's not so much that people... I mean, we can see here that obviously in these revivals, people are accepting the messages Jones and Wagner and Sister White are presenting. Them. But the work, the message has not been allowed to do its work and it has been distorted. And, and that was one of the things that was kind of difficult when I started studying this message in the eighties, um, was that I heard lots of lip service, and especially books that profess to be teaching righteousness by faith, 
but it didn't agree with what Jones was teaching or even what the spirit of prophecy was saying. And, and this was something that really puzzled me. Why was Adventism um, not accepting this message? You know, as, as a new Adventist, you know, hearing this message, reading Jones and Wagner, in our upper room Bible studies, studying it. Um, it was, you know, it was definitely doing its work, but it, it wasn't so much that people were openly opposing the message of righteousness by faith. It's just that other uh, varieties of righteousness by faith were being presented to Adventists. And so it, if you were talking about righteousness by faith, and you had certain beliefs, such as, you know, Jesus had the same nature that Adam had after Adam fell. You know, he had a sinful human nature. Uh, this was looked down upon. The other thing which has really grown over time is this opposition to the idea of the final generation. So we know that uh, the Adventist church, its, its leadership, its ministry is really opposed to the idea that the final generation is they call it last generation theology that this final generation will ref reflect Christ's character. They think that this is I've, I've heard it from minister friends of mine that this is the great danger to Adventism to believe in this last generation theology. And people like George R. Knight are ones who have uh, laid the blame on A. T. Jones and M. L. Andreas and, and others who have been teaching this, right? So that this is some kind of heresy that came in as a result of, they believe, of a distortion of Jones and Wagner's message, that it wasn't initially a part of their message. And, and it's quite clearly that it was the main focus of their message, is the work that Christ wanted to accomplish in humanity. So anyway, we will... Um, you know, we'll look into that further, especially when we get into uh, the two books on Galatians, Butler's book and Wagner's book. So any any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, well, let's pray. Well, I thought I was trying to type it out. I'll just say it. it was, uh, okay. The thought is, the thought is, um, when they called the darkness light and the light darkness and how great was that darkness mm -hmm. I know it's, it's so cryptic but um, there's quite a darkness when it comes to not understanding and they're also going to they're also going to ask for um, we keep saying the message and doing its work and well, if we could sum that up in three sentences, what would that be? The message, the work it's supposed okay. to do. Well, so the first thing is we know that the everlasting gospel is three messages, right? The first, second, and third angels message. And this is an experience that God's people must have, right? That is, it's a three-step testing prophetic message. And Ooh, one of my favorite spirit of prophecy passages on that you say the experience that God's people must have is uh Isaiah. So Isaiah and woe is me and the experience of the worm before God. Mm -hmm. She says that all of God's people must have that experience. Right. So is this part of the message of righteousness by faith, the humbling of the dust? Right. Humbling in the dust so Glory, pride of man. Glory of man in the dust. It, yeah. And so because we're sinners and and we don't really like the light, God can't just give us the full glory of the light all at once, right? We have an experience that we have to go through. Light comes to us bit by bit and we respond to light. And in order to have the power of Christ's righteousness in our lives, the Holy Spirit is to give us, um, convince us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, 
and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And and soon shall he be cast out. Elamite adds to that. So, so we know that we have to go through an experience of accepting of light. And that message is a prophetic message. That if we try to skip the first and second angel's messages and just jump into the third, that we're not going to have the conviction and the power because the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, in reality, as expressed in the life. And what, what this movement has gone through has been to show us our need of Christ. It is meant to break us down so that we can depend upon God. But instead, yeah. we have taken yeah. the message yeah. to... What's that? I'll be your dad. It, what it, it is meant to break us down. The yes, experience, the mess, the prophetic message. So the, the experience, experience that we, for instance, of July 18th failing was to show us, it was to humble us, right? Because we were proud. We were thinking, okay, <laughs> you know, naturally to be hit by a fireball and we'll all be vindicated. And, and all of our friends will now listen to us and, and, and we're going to be lifted well, up I as had an none of those thoughts. I had none of mm-hmm. those thoughts. I had none of those thoughts. But many people did. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised in a way, but when you say well, many, I'm like surprised that there would be that many that I see a few maybe getting puffed up about it or whatever or being aha, I'm right, but. I don't know. Uh, I was kind of well, catching my death. That, that, <laughs> well, we do know but, that many of the know, people... I, I, I believe that it could well have happened but anyway. Well, we know so, many of the people... I know there's this delay here. So many of the people after July 18, um, one of the things they expressed why they rejected it is because uh, they were embarrassed. Hmm. Right. Uh, but also as for them. <laughs> but also just it was it was something that was expressed before July 18th very clearly that people were looking for a type of vindication so that we could then give the message so people would then listen to us. And that was one of the reasons why I and really exit, was happy. Exit strategy. What's that? We wanted an exit strategy in place. Exit strategy in place. Yeah, well, to me, I mean, the problem that I was having with it was um, I didn't see how we were ready for what God was planning to, you know, what would have happened if Nashville had occurred. Uh, it had uh, happened, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, we'd been... be on the world stage, and we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be prepared for that. Um, no. Yeah, and so... So that's that was one of the reasons I I was sort of wondering how can God just change us just because the message is going to if it if the event happened I didn't see that 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 and I recognized I was completely un, un, unprepared for for that. But what an amazing experience to to be faced with that possibility and actually believe it. I mean, yeah, it was. It's it's so big. It's got to be divine. Just that very idea that the whole world would would have taken taken note. And what would we have to give them? Not much. Uh Yeah. Anyway, well, let's close with prayer. Thanks, thanks for those comments, Kelly. Uh, Dear Father in heaven, um, we are thankful for the Sabbath and for the fellowship we can have. We ask for your Holy Spirit to bring this conviction to our lives and that we can uh, continue to study your word and that we can grow. I pray for each person, pray for, for Kelly, for myself, for others here, for the struggles that we face each day in our battle with self. And we just ask Lord that you can not just show us our sin, but show us your forgiveness and mercy and grace that we can experience the joy of your salvation. And we ask this and we pray it in Jesus' name.
Amen.